Brian Wren is Emeritus Professor of Worship at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. He is a writer, preacher, worship and workshop leader, internationally published hymn poet, with entries in most recent hymnals. Um, hymnals in North America, Britain, and Australia. Some of his hymn poems have been translated into Finnish, French, Japanese, Mandarin, Spanish, and Korean. He holds undergraduate and doctoral degrees from Oxford University. Dr. Wren is a minister of the United Reformed Church, UK. His publications include What Language Shall I Borrow, God Talk and Worship, A Male Response to Feminist Theology, Praying Twice, The Music and Words of Congregational Song, Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany, Liturgies and Prayers for Public Worship, uh, and Hymns for Today. In addition, he has seven hymn collections, totaling uh, over 250 hymns. Brian Ridd is a partner in marriage and ministry to Reverend Susan, Susan Hayfield, who is with us today, and Susan will be assisting uh, during this lecture. Today, Brian, together, Brian and Susan have published two collections of worship songs spanning the Christian year. Um, we Can Be Messengers and Tell the Good News are both available in book and CD form. It is our wonderful privilege today to introduce Dr. Wren, Dr. Brian Wren, as a 2013 North Cut Lecture. Let me thank you for the welcome and say two things as I start. One is I'm sitting down because it's painful for me to stand. I, I have arthritis problems. So that, this is not a huge marimba, this is a, a table. <laughs> and the, that's the first thing. The other thing is that if I stand in, or I sit in very good company, the list of previous lecturers is impressive. Some I know, um, and uh, I'm glad to see here. And I'd rather you were uh, able to come yourselves. The second thing is I, I'm a stroke survivor, and therefore I sometimes don't enunciate clearly. If you notice that I'm not enunciating clearly, please raise your hand. I mean, don't walk out, walk out, raise your hand. <laughs> I'll try and, I do, I do slip into mumbling, that's an English fault. So if, if I'm not speaking clearly enough, please raise your hand, and that will bring me back to reality. My subject is more to follow a lyricist appreciation of P.P. P. Bliss. And it began by saying how I met P.P. P. Bliss, or rather met his hymns. When Susan and I were first married in 1991, she was then serving two small churches in northeast Pennsylvania, in the town of Rome, 400 people and 20 dogs, <laughs> a fire station, a general store, parsonage, and a gospel songwriters museum, which was in a house opposite opposite the parsonage. It was formed in 1964 to preserve the memory of P.P. P. Bliss and other gospel songwriters of the 19th century. And we visited the museum and found a number of artifacts, papers, music, and also the big item I suppose was the melodeon that belonged to Philip Paul Bliss. He was born in 1838 in July in a log cabin in Pennsylvania. His father was, I think, not very, not very well off. But as the boy grew, I think it sounded like a loving family from what I can tell. As he grew, he had a strong physique. If you Google his name after this lecture, you may find a portrait, which is an impressive portrait, unfortunately before the advent of photography a very distinguished presence. And when he, his voice broke, he had a, he took a wonderful singing voice and a natural gift. I would love to have heard him sing. It is said that one of his songs was demonstrated at the first uh, demonstration of Edison's photograph. If anybody can find that, there's a doctorate there for you. <laughs> Probably disappeared by now. If that was, if that was still in, in being, it would be a wonderful thing. He had little formal education 
and was taught mostly by his mother and from the Bible. He had very early on evinced a love of music and that was with him throughout his life. As he grew into his teens, he had the physique of a man, so he was strung up to a man's dog, man's job in logging and lumber camps and sawmills. At one point he was assistant cook in the lumber camp, then he became a log cutter and a sawmill worker. He began to participate in Methodist camp meetings and revival services. At age 17, in 1855, he went to Bradford City, Pennsylvania and finished the last requirements for his teaching credentials. Next year he was the schoolmaster in a town in New York. At some, at some point in that, that time sequence he met Lucy Young and they began, they loved each other and were married when Bliss was just 21. And in later years they sang duets together in the service of Christ. <clears throat> he taught music pupils in the evening to supplement his income. At age 22 had enough knowledge of music to become an itinerant music teacher. In 1864, when he was 26, they moved to Chicago. And he began to conduct musical institutes, became widely known as a singer and teacher. His poems and compositions flowed out with regularity. He collaborated with George Root in the writing and publishing of gospel songs. Sometime in the summer of 1869, he was passing a revival meeting in a church where Dwight Moody was preaching. Bliss went inside to listen. That night, Moody was without, was without musical help, and the singing was rather weak. From the audience, Philip attracted Moody's attention. Moody came to the door and got Bliss's particulars and said, you're welcome to come at any time and help me with the singing. He further urged him to give up his business and become a singing evangelist. Not long afterwards, that's exactly what Bliss decided to do. He gave up everything he had up to that point, his musical conventions, the writing of secular songs, his business position, his work at sacred music, so that he could work at sacred music in evangelism. In particular, he would be Major Daniel Whittle's song evangelist and child worker. His life, his and Lucy's life, ended when they were quite young in their late 30s. December the 29th or 30th, I'm not quite sure which, 1876, the Pacific Express was struggling along in a blinding snowstorm about three hours late on a Friday afternoon. Eleven coaches pulled by two agents were creeping through huge snowdrifts approaching Ashtonville, Ohio, passing over a trestle bridge spanning a river. The first engine reached solid ground on the other side Everything else plummeted 75 feet into the icy water. It is said that Bliss managed to break free and get clear of the train. But he went back in search of Lucy and he found her trapped underneath some wreckage. And then a fire broke out. And they both perished together in the fire. This was a traumatic event at the time, obviously. It still leaves sense of many years later. Their two sons, George and Philip Paul, who were four and one, survived and were, I think, doubtless looked after by their grandparents. That's a short version of his life. I think a remarkable life with great gifts. I'm going to give a lyricist appreciation of him. I am a lyricist, which means I write words that could be sung. <laughs> Whether they are or not is not in my hands. <laughs> And I want to give my appreciation of him. Remember, remember this is 1870, not 1970. If you're in search of inclusive language, you won't find it. Because relatively modern concerns were just out of sight, out of mind for those folks. He was part of the evangelical movement. The gospel was presented as God's great gift to humankind through Christ and the various renderings of it but always in Bliss's presentation, a joyful thing, a source of joy, good news. The nearest he gets to hellfire and damnation is his one hymn where he begins almost persuading, almost you persuade me to become a Christian, 
said the cripple to Paul, and almost persuaded is a verse rendering of that, and it ends with the somber message, almost, but lost. That's the nearest he gets to any kind of stark judgment. Most of his, his version of the gospel is joyful. Let me find an example to read for you. Come, sing the gospel's joyful sound, salvation full and free. Proclaim to all the world around the year of jubilee. Salvation, salvation, the grace of God doth bring. Salvation, salvation, through Christ our Lord and King. Ye mourning souls, a loud rejoice. Ye blind, your Saviour see. Ye prisoners sing with thankful voice. The Lord hath made you free. That echoes Charles Wesley. Ye blind, behold your Saviour come, and leap ye lame for joy. That's the tenor of this version of the gospel, very joyful, a, a, a source of joy and salvation. Let me invite you to turn in the handout, this lovely handout on two sides of a sheet of paper. There's a hymn called, where is it? Hold the Fort. Yeah. This phrase, hold the fort, goes back to a military order wired by General William Tecumseh Sherman in 1864 during the Civil War to General John Course in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Records apparently show that the actual words were, hold out, relief is coming. But hold the fort caught the imagination. Became a very, especially when Jim Bliss turned it into a gospel song, it became a very popular song. Mm -hmm. Hold the fort for I'm coming. Let me invite you to take yourself back that time and sing this song with Susan Williams. If 
invite you to listen to this and then sing the same verses, stanzas one and three, to get the flavor of it.
Yes, Luke chapter 15 has three parables in it. The parable of the, the lost sheep, the parable of the woman searching for her coin, possibly her dowry, and the parable of the two brothers. The two, two brothers who, one who runs off and spends all the money and then comes back. And then the father goes out to welcome him. Tenderly the shepherd, o'er the mountains cold, goes to bring the lost one back to the fold, seeking to save, seeking to save. Lost one, tis Jesus, seeking to save. Seeking to save, seeking to save. Lost one, tis Jesus, seeking to save. Have you heard that phrase enough now? <laughs> My guess is you'll go back, you may leave it here without in your mind. Well, even though I've not sung it, it embeds itself in your mind. Patiently the owner, notice the word owner, for the woman. May patiently the owner sits with earnest care in the dust and darkness, her treasure rare. Seeking to save, seeking to save. Lost one, tis Jesus, seeking to save. And then lovingly the Father sends the news around. He once dead now liveth, once lost is found. Seeking to save. In that parable, the uh, prodigal son comes home and the Father goes to brothers, runs to meet him now. Running was not something that a man did, any respectable man did in any culture at the time. You walked with great dignity, and this, this father throws dignity to the winds and runs to meet his son and embraces him. And he leaves the banquet and goes out to plead with the other, with the elder, the elder brother who's disgruntled outside and says, Please come in. So twice in, in a very short time he abandons his dignity and goes out to plead with his sons to come and be part of the celebration. We had to celebrate as your brother, your brother, who was dead and all this, he was lost and found. Whereas the, the other the son said, your son, the, your son, your son squandered the family fortune. Your brother, says the father, your brother. Sometimes, besides instead of paraphrasing scripture with an evangelistic touch, this one, one place he has a very, I think, imaginative use of scripture. In Luke 13, 6, there is a parable that goes like this. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well good. If not, you may cut it down. Let's talk that parable and turn it into a dialogue between two voices, justice and mercy. We're going to hear that sent to us by Scott and Amy. I invite you to listen to this and join in on the last verse.
give them a round of applause. I want to share with you one more hint on the handout. It's the very first hint I ever came across by a PP Bliss. And what I retain from this is the last line of each verse. Hallelujah, hallelujah, what a saviour. The theology of this is again not mine, but every verse ends with that great acclamation. It's what sticks in the mind, I think, when you've when you sung the hymn. Hallelujah, what a saviour. I'm going to ask Susan to play through them all, let's sing it together. And to feel the power of that last line as it comes through each time. A great outpouring of praise.
two word choices. In Hallelujah, what a saviour, notice the choice of words in the first sense of ruined sinners to reclaim. The word ruined. It's a very powerful word, I think. And if you write hymns, you need to be careful how you choose your adjectives. You need a strong adjective if you're going to use one. Nouns are usually stronger. But I think ruined is a, is a very powerful word. It suggests a derelict building that's how we live in. There's a ruined building at the end of the road, and it really is ruined. And I think of, I pass it, I think of Bliss's choice of words, ruined sinners to reclaim. And in one of the words of life, also freely given, not calling us to heaven, but wooing us to heaven. A divine search that is meant to attract us without being seductive, wooing us to heaven. Uh, I think that's a great, a wonderful choice of words. Some hymnals are find a bit too uh, sexy, so they, they tone it down. <laughs> this work wooing us to heaven, I think that's the right word choice. Thank you for coming. I've enjoyed being here. I hope I've introduced you to someone whose lyrics are worth following up. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, we have missed one, an important one for a We missed the title of the lecture. Ah. Oh, yes, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, you turn to let the Lord lights be burning. This, I think, used topical events as a basis of many of his hymns. This is allegedly a story that was reported as on the news. There is again room for research to go back and find the sources, see if it actually exists in a newspaper at the time. It is said that on a stormy night, this I think uh, near in Cleveland Harbour, a ship was coming in. I think it would have been a sailing ship at that era. And the lighthouse on the cliff top was, was visible, but there was fog below and the lower lights had gone out. And the captain said, well, the lighthouse is a light, but I can't see the lower lights. And the ship ran aground because the lower lights were not lit. And we are, we are the lower lights. We have a responsibility to reach out to people, not just pastors, ministers, and licensed evangelists, but all of us. So when we sing this, we are the lower lights. And I invite you to see yourself in that role. And again, I think if there's someone, anyone wants to go back and look through the newspaper events of, of that time, maybe it's a story about the shipwreck of Cleveland. If you can find it out again, that's again part of a, do, a good doctoral program. <laughs> Let the Lord lights be burning, send their gleam across the wave. Some for fainting, struggling seaman or sailor, you may rescue, you may save. Let's sing that.
His gospel message is in the essential. But the, if you listen to the gospel message and you are converted, if you become awake to Christ in your life, that is only the beginning. There is more to follow. A wonderful positive sound there. If you turn to that hymn here, more to follow, there's a story attached to it, which again may all not be true. The story goes that a fortune was left in the hands of a minister for one of his male parishioners. The minister, not wanting to uh, dump it all on the man of one city, and then misspend it, sent it, sent it in, in small portions, saying, this is yours to spend as you wish, use it wisely, there is more to follow. And this is a great uh, song about the Christian life, about the gifts that God promises, there is more to follow. I invite you to sing it with that in mind.